John Stanley, a face I've seen many times on screen, but this is really the first time we've properly met. It is, isn't it? It is, and it surprised me actually from talking to you how much more you've done apart from cars. We know you as a classic car expert, but you, you've got a bit of a, a wide and checkered history, haven't you? Well, you, were, you got hold of a CV, didn't you? <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> yes, I mean, cars have always been a passion. I mean, I've, I've adored them since being a member of the Oxford Motor Club back in art school days. But uh, yes, there is another world outside cars, as indeed it is for enthusiasts. I mean, people, very few people actually live and breathe just cars. And uh, I've had a lot to do with show business and a great deal to do with music and a certain amount with public figures. But I imagine recently cars have been taking up a huge part of your life because you've been working on this, haven't you? The, the second volume of Stanley, the Stanley Classic Car Yearbook. Yes, that does take about six months of the year, but um, it's just a delight to do because I love cars. And I'm not particularly a fan of the classic tag. I think a classic car is something that, rather like a pet that adopts you or that you like. I don't think it's anything really to do with the years in question. So this kind of idea that, okay, a car's now 20 years old, it suddenly becomes a classic. You think classics can be from any year? It's critical if you're going to compete. Obviously, you've mm. got to have a cutoff point. And the RAC were really forced into this by the sheer volume of interest. And so the 20 year cutoff makes sense. But in real terms, a, a motoring enthusiast will love a car irrespective of the year it was made. It's what that character has, what that car will do, how it even looks. A lot of it's to do with appearances. I think that love you do have for classics comes across in the book, and certainly in this huge chunk of it, which is Stanley's Classic 100. What criteria do you use for selecting those cars? It's purely cars that I either love or hate. Um, there aren't many of them, but there are one or two that are turkeys. And um, they're really just, I believe that classic cars in the sense are very much as if you and I were in the pub talking. It's a, it's a collective thing. We've all got opinions on cars that we like to share them. We'll listen to each other. It won't necessarily mean we'll alter our opinion. Yeah. But it is an exchange of information. It's rather like with pop groups. You like a particular pop group and you support them, but you're open to, have you heard so-and-so? Yeah. And then you go away and listen to it. And it's a bit that with cars. And the Stanley 100 is very much if you like, my menu of 100 cars that I find interesting, stimulating, or sadly, in one or two cases, <laughs> mistakes. I seem to be giving Ford a bad time, and I don't really mean it, but some of the recent styling have been a bit sad. Well, before the new edge design, do you mean? Or? Well, I mean, the Scorpio doesn't seem to have a reason to exist. I mean, that, I, mean I think I headlined it in last year's book as why. And unfortunately, the, the probe, in a way, represents a huge mistake. Um, it had no excuse to be that poor because the Capri had a very solid following. The Probe has none of the needs, it has none of the line, the, 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 there isn't any muscle, there's no sense of line or form down the side. It just looks like a kit car put on top of a platform. And that's a sad thing for Ford to have done because they've made some gorgeous cars in the past. Well, as you said, there's turkeys and there's some, a lot of good cars in there. How many of these have you actually driven? Pretty much all of them, yeah. I mean, one or two of the Stanley 100. Um, there's a Lynx in there, for instance, a Lee Francis Lynx, which I don't think anyone drove, um, which actually that too was a turkey. That was actually at a motor show, and it was mauve with gold instead of chrome. Mm. And um, for Lee Francis, who again had had a distinguished career in the past, that was a bit sad. I haven't driven that because I don't think, I don't even know if it still exists. Mm -hmm. But by and large, yes, all of them. And certainly all the main road tests are all a uh, matter of uh, driving and assessment. and John, from the classic list, of course, you've done The Unthinkable, and you've picked one as the star of the book. How did you manage to choose that? This year, it's the British sports cars from the 60s. They're all two-seaters, and again, they have to be under a £1,000. And it is all the editors of the motoring magazines. It is those who have a feeling and a passion. And this year, yes, this year, it's the Austin Healey that's won. And it won by what? By an, a, a huge, huge margin. margin. Last year it was much closer between the Morris Minor and the VW Beetle, which would have pleased you, wouldn't it? Yeah, my um, first car. But uh, this year it was a runaway success for the Healey 3000 with the Lotus 7 running behind it, but some ways behind. What do you think the appeal of the Healey is? Well, it's still a style statement. It's not just that it was a powerful car. In fact, um, the image it's got is largely one of being a very hairy beast. And in last year's book, I talked about a drive I had in the last works car, which was a very hairy beast. But they were very rare, just like the 
current rally cars are? There's definitely a huge crop of sports cars out there at the moment. Um, I think manufacturers are going more and more back to this kind of retro image. They're always, almost trying to recreate instant classics. I did undertake the sort of major piece in this year's book is a 20,000 word report, which is rather longer than any motoring magazine could cope with. Yeah. It's one of the charms of a book is you've got space. It's a bit like having a TV special. Sure. You've got extra time. And in there, I've spent five months in the end testing 12 modern sports cars that are all claiming to be classics in some form or another. And most of them are working quite seriously on using retro styling. You and I have both driven most of them. I've certainly have driven all of them. There does really seem to be a huge crop of, of good sports cars around at the minute. Which, which were the ones that stood out to you from that crop? Well, the 12 that I made tests on um, covered the whole gambit from the little um, MX-5 and the MGF, which I was a little disappointed with, mm -hmm. all the way through to the 355 Ferrari. And the therefore, price range there as well. It's really. huge, but it, I've tried. N it's not a comparative. Magazines have a terrible habit, for the sake of selling their their journal, of making comparisons between cars that really aren't alike. And it's not fair on either manufacturer because they've aimed at a specific market, and suddenly they're being compared and damned by a car from a different bracket. So I've, they're isolated pieces. However, they do group up in some ways. Some of them are sporting cars, some of them are sports cars, and some of them are really GTs. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're grouped, but they're not compared. Of them, I suppose the Mercedes SLK was a bit of a disappointment. Um, Why? I found, uh, indeed, I took a picture of it with a C-class saloon, because there's no shame in that, but that's actually all it is. It is a saloon with sophisticated styling. Yeah. As a Grand Tourer, for that kind of money, the roof's very clever and they have a reputation like they did with the old gullwing of clever roofs. And that's fine, perpetuate that. But when it came down to it, to Grand Tour in that car, you're going to be reasonably well heeled and you will have luggage. The publishers didn't publish the picture, which I would have loved. I took a picture of the boot with the hood down, which is after all what you're going to have if it's cruising and it would take a standard size Kellogg's cornflake packet and that's the height of your luggage. That's no good, that's not a grand tourer, that's a grand show off. It seems to have, be struggling to find exactly where it fits. And the automatic gearbox is, mm. is a lovely gearbox. But not in a sporting no, car. No, it gets in a muddle, it, yeah. it tries, it has this intelligence which will work out your style and give you the gear you want. But halfway through a corner you'd really rather have transmission than hear it whirring while it sorts out your mind. Don't you really think that a sports car is all about the fact that you've got to have fun in it, you've got to be allowed to drive it and whip it through those gears yourself? Yeah, I mean the XK8, which is in here too, um, that curiously enough works, but then it doesn't pretend to be a sports car so much as it's a, a, grand tourer. Yeah, a Grand Tourer. And Grand Touring really with an automatic isn't a contradiction because long haul you might as well be comfortable. It has the power and if you kick it down, it works. So what about that out and out fun? What's one to put a smile on your fun. face and let you oh. zip round those roads in? I don't know. I suppose the Porsche Boxster, which I know you've experienced, is a gem. It's an, I'm not a big Porsche fan, but that car is a delight. Mm. And there's a lot more room in it, as we've both discovered, than it appears.